नाउ वी आर या um namaste uh good morning uh good afternoon good evening uh tashi delek um it's a privilege for me to be a part of this amazing conference thing. is being recorded uh his uh, holiness the dalai lama had said and i quote the purpose of our lives is to be happy happiness is not something ready made it comes from your own actions if you want others to be happy practice compassion if you want to be happy practice compassion only the development of compassion and understanding for others brings us the tranquility and happiness we all seek with the ever growing impact of science on our lives spirituality has a greater role to play reminding us of our humanity the challenge of covid-19 has shown we need more compassion than ever before in our lives after all as the sars cov2 virus has shown our lives are so fragile we need to think beyond ourselves moving past that desire to assert ourselves to prove that we are always right and today we have the opportunity to do just that we have with us the venerable priyadarshini tenzin in conversation with mrs sunita reddy the venerable tenzin priyadarshini is the president and ceo of the dalai lama center for ethics and transformative values at the massachusetts institute of technology a center dedicated to inquiry dialogue and education on the ethical and humane dimensions of life six nobel peace laureates serve as the center's founding members and its programs run in several countries and are expanding venerable tenzin's unusual background encompasses entering a buddhist monastery at the age of 10 and receiving graduate education at harvard university with degrees ranging from philosophy to physics to international relations he's a tribeca disruptive fellow and a 2018 fellow at the center of advanced study in behavioral sciences at stanford university when rebel tenzin serves on the board of numerous academic humanitarian and religious organizations He is the recipient of several recognitions and awards and received Harvard's distinguished alumni honors for his visionary contributions to humanity. He directed the Ethics Initiative to help foster critical conversations on ethics and emerging technologies with focus on AI and CRISPR in particular. He coined the expression ethics as optimization to convey a distinctive approach to ethics learning. He has made his admiration for saint francis of assisi quite public and travels to italy often and as saint francis has said it is in giving that we receive and we are so fortunate the venerable that you are going to be giving so generously to us of your knowledge and wisdom he lectures internationally on subjects from philosophy science ethics and religion to socio political thought he also teaches traditional buddhist philosophy and practice and we are so privileged to have you with us mrs sunita reddy is the managing director of the apollo hospitals group a member of the founding family she joined the enterprise in 1989 since then as the finance director of the company she has spearheaded several fundraising and investment decisions which have played a key role in the group's sustained growth and profitability She's a member of the Harvard India Advisory Board and served as a member of the Harvard Business School Medical Advisory Board. In 2018, 19, and 20, she was featured among the top four in Fortune India's list of most powerful women. She's also the recipient of the Business Today's Most Powerful Women in India Business Awards 2019, and recently she received the Business Woman of the Year Award 2020 from the Economic Times. she's director on the board of the chennai international center she is an alumnus of stella maris college the ifmr graduate school of business and the harvard business school before i hand over to mrs reddy i'd request all our participants from across the globe if they have any questions they should type them into the chat box and then mrs reddy will if the opportunity arises be able to raise them with the venerable priyadarshini tenzin over to you mrs reddy thank you anupam namaste to everyone my special thanks to venerable tenzin priyadarshi who was able to honor us with his presence on this very auspicious 
full moon evening uh, before i start i would like to spend 30 minutes remembering those who could not be here and 30 sec sorry 30 seconds remembering those who could not be with us here today and 30 seconds in gratitude for those who have we have with us venerable tenzin priyadarshi your name means one who looks upon others with love i've also heard that it was a name given to ashoka so it's something really special while reading your book i came across this aham shutra shutra shutva which which means thus have i heard so i've heard so much about you i've read so much in your book you were born in kolkata you ran away to patna and then you took a bus to rajgriha where you were in a japanese monastery as described in your book running towards mystery can you share with us the experience of a young child who wanted to be a monk a buddhist monk and also tell us have you stopped running is life still a mystery well firstly uh, uh Uh, it's a delight and and thank you for uh, uh having me this morning or or evening there um and uh i'm glad that we began with the practice of remembrance and gratitude and i think it is something that uh, each one of us should uh, incorporate in our day to day life uh, i think we'll be better as humans we'll be better as a society if we could remember the kindness Uh, of uh, uh, people around us, um, and express that sense of gratitude. Um, I don't think I've stopped running yet, <laughs> but but my running is a different kind of running. Uh, it's not a running where uh, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, I don't think I'm running after something. Uh, it's more of a running of um, uh, a kind of beckoning, uh, meaning. uh feeling a sense of call to something uh which was the initial sort of instigator for um uh why i ran away um at such a young age um, um and i guess you know there are different kinds of running uh that particular running was uh, driven by perhaps a sense of seeking um and so i, I still continue to seek <laughs> That's a wonderful answer. Uh, from your book, I read that uh, your uncle once told you to approach Buddhism not as a believer, but as someone who was looking for something based on facts. So you grew up in a household with a very open mind in a Hindu household. You met and admired Mother Teresa. You were inspired by the work of uh, Viveka Swami Vivekananda. and you were the student of samdong rampoche who was your teacher you also had uh, sig- meaning in conversations with j krishnamurti so tell me what impact did all these experiences have on your life and who who really had the maximum influence in your life i've left out the dalai lama in that sentence but please tell us who had the maximum impact in your life i think uh, you know uh, it will be hard to gauge who had the maximum impact uh, they all continue to uh, you know they have influenced and many of them continue to influence uh, my way of looking at the world uh, they continue to influence um, how i think about certain things and the beauty of you know uh, all these individuals present in my life uh, is simply uh, the the sense that uh, that the there's so much to learn and there is so much to sort of observe and there are uh, individuals around you or i 
uh, that if we are open-minded and we are trying to sort of uh, learn something or seek something out, that they can all be sort of instrumental uh, teachers, advisors, uh, mentors uh, in that process. And even sometimes if they may seem to be giving uh, advice that seems counterthetical at that moment. So uh, like my grandfather suggesting that I should take a scholastic approach to Buddhism uh, because he was a historian, um, uh, uh, you know, he wasn't particularly religious and, uh, and he thought that, you know, uh, the, the history of Buddhism in India, especially um, in, um, uh, in, in its early period uh, at Nalanda and other places, that, uh, you know, monks and, and, and individuals spent a tremendous amount of time uh, studying uh, and deliberating uh, 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 aspects of teachings of the Buddha. And so the whole idea was that, you know, that one should not become just some kind of blind uh, believer uh, in, the, in the teachings. And Buddha is somebody who has also constantly reminded um, us of this, uh, which is uh, encouragement that we should uh, um, push the boundaries of reason and reasoning to, uh, to really understand uh, what the worldview is. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, spiritual world oftentimes is driven by uh, a simple sense of faith. Uh, but in order for that faith to have a sense of clarity and for that faith to really blossom in, 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 um, in a fruitful manner, uh, I think it is important for individuals to explore, to seek, to be curious. Um, and, and those are all aspects of spiritual practice. I love that. To seek, to always be curious. I'll add maybe also hungry, but uh, you know, during the financial crisis of 2008, I think you witnessed the mayhem on Wall Street. And during that difficult period, I think, you know, the sense was that we had lost that sense of ethics and governance that seemed to have dominated your, your thought process. So can you please tell us about whether this episode acted as a catalyst for you joining MIT? Um, I was at MIT Prior to that, um, it's been uh, it's been almost uh, 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 twenty years there. Uh, what the financial meltdown catalyzed was uh, uh, the idea to establish the Center for Ethics and Transformative Values there, uh, with the simple reasoning and and you know again based on observation, which was that while we were uh, focused a lot in giving certain kinds of skill sets to, um, to our students anywhere in the world. Um, one of the things that financial meltdown uh, uh, revealed was that we were not um, training individuals in some particular skill sets that would make them a good member of civic society. You see, so we could have skill sets in analysis, we could even have skill sets in projection, financial projection, we could have understanding and creation of complex uh, economic theories, and so on. But if you, you know, if you sort of analyze the reason for financial meltdown, um, uh, the last one, uh, you can almost sort of, you know, point to greed and deceit uh, being the catalyst for that. And so you begin to ask yourself that how do you train individuals against greed and deceit. You, see, uh, you know, when most of the society tends to believe that greed is the sincerest of human emotions, uh, you know. Uh, so the idea is then that, you know, can we invest some time and energy uh, building a system, building an education system, building a civic system uh, that promotes this idea of uh, of engagement with ethics and, and, and ethical life and, and, and so on. Meaning that it's, it's, a, it's an endeavor just beyond religious or spiritual belief, meaning it is, it is something that is important to, uh, uh, for the creation of a robust uh, uh, civic society. Uh, you know, um, in, in 2010, uh, one of the things that we observed was a tremendous sense of 
leadership deficit in the world. They were very uh, difficult to count good leaders who are around us. Uh, 10 years past that episode, we are still experiencing a leadership deficit in the world. There's no shortage of leadership programs in the world, but we are experiencing a leadership deficit. And so all of these things simply sort of uh, point to the idea that we as a civic society need to work uh, more diligently, more collaboratively um, uh, in terms of creating the society that we actually want to create. Uh, and it is everybody's uh, uh, prerogative to, to, uh, to invest in it, meaning that, that we should not think of uh, you know, ethics or goodness as a magical thing that some people will have and others won't, that it is something that we should encourage people to, to train in. Totally agree. And that's why you're president and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center of Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT. So you've, um, you haven't spoken about AI and, um, and you know how, we how at the intersection of human intelligence, as we call it in, in healthcare, the interface of AI with human intelligence, and what do you believe that outcome will bring? I think it's it's still sort of uh, uh, too early to to pinpoint the outcome of of such endeavors. But where it's going right now, I think, is that you know there are two camps. Uh, uh, one is the camp of the techno utopians who think that AI is going to save everything, uh, and then the other is uh, uh, the doomsday <laughs> doomsday camp, which is that AI is going to destroy the world. Uh, I think I'm somewhere in the middle, uh, uh, or, which is, I think, a, a balanced approach. Um, you know, uh, not all aspects of human intelligence are yet replicated uh, in designing uh, AI systems. Uh, but there are certain kinds of, um, uh, I would say, intellectual disposition. Um, that it's easier to replicate in AI systems. But as we are doing that, there are, there are broader sort of conversations uh, to be had, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, I think designing of AI systems and its deployment in fields of medicine and fields of education, uh, legal systems and so on, which is already happening, uh, what you do see is, is um, you know, that it does create a tremendous sense of efficiency um, uh, because, of course, it is able to sort of uh, capture and process uh, uh, large data sets um, uh, in a much more sort of uh, efficient manner than, than humans or groups of humans are able to do. Uh, the other thing is that AI does show more objectivity uh, than humans do in terms of processing certain things. So, uh, you know, there are rumors of uh, certain boards wanting AI on their boards to be able to do future projections so that it's not just tied to the, uh, the emotional disposition of, 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 of the board members and so on. But in the long run, I think, you know, it, it also poses interesting questions about, um, you know, uh, what does it mean to be human uh, in, in the age of AI, in the age of such kinds of emerging technologies, that are almost sort of replicating human intelligence to the point that it might even replace certain things that we value. For example, work. Um, uh, that if it uh, begins to um, uh, replace uh, human employment, for example, uh, and we are already in a state where we see large scale unemployment in certain uh, parts of the world. It, it raises other kinds of questions, which is that how can a civic society and government policies uh, do better to integrate such systems so that we can still thrive and flourish as humans uh, and use AI um, as it was initially designed to be, which is an assistive technology, uh, rather than thinking that it is going to just take over all that we do. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex scenario, but I would, I would keep the response brief. So I'll take you away from the complex scenario. And, and I really um, want to know, 
what gives you joy and what makes you laugh because in harvard i believe you took 22 credits the first semester so how do we move beyond the enigma that you are a uh, venerable priya dashi i think that was my undergrad at 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 um, at syracuse um um uh, uh uh i had just arrived uh, and and finished a one year of uh, uh uh senior year in the high school and then went to went into college um and um as i said that you know uh one of the things that i didn't get to do in india uh you know uh, of course i pushed myself so i could have monastic education while sort of uh, continuing on uh, in in secular studies as well but one of the things that that uh, that american universities uh, enabled me to do was to do cross disciplinary studies or interdisciplinary studies um and you know i was a monk i was trained as a monk so there wasn't uh, uh, too many other sort of activities that that i found uh, uh, perhaps of interest um and so um i just uh, took a deep dive into whatever it is that i could study and and so i um you know um just you know started doing what i really wanted to do which was to study philosophy and physics together um and uh, and uh, uh and you know uh, just kept taking whatever amount of uh, uh courses or classes uh, uh, i could take um i think the the again the joy part is the the driver in terms of the sense of curiosity it was the joy of learning the joy of learning new things the joy of learning a discipline that allows me to see the world um uh in in certain manners um and and that is something you know in the book also i emphasize in in this one chapter that's title is there so much joy in your religion and and this is a reminder that that i often uh propose to people that you see the the you know uh not to focus so much on religious institution but the enterprise of religion that that you know especially in india and growing up in any kind of an tradition um uh, you know the goals are soteriological meaning that all um religious philosophical systems in india with the exception of perhaps uh, uh charvakas uh, and so on that the goal was that that you seek freedom that you seek liberation uh you know and so one of the things that i have often uh, tried to suggest is that that we should not make our practice of religion or practice of spirituality and so on a miserable experience you see uh, there are so many avenues in in our life where we are miserable where we suffer uh, our practice of religion should not be one of those places meaning that that religion is precisely a place where we ought to experience joy in real time and seek freedom from things that are not conducive to our sense of uh, well-being that's interesting but i still haven't seen you laugh so <laughs> yeah. finally so uh, i'm going to move on to the next question which is really about uh, reincarnation you know we've had the privilege to have read a, a book by brian weiss many lives many masters so we understand that this uh, process of reincarnation is not partic- is not you know it's not just india but it's something that's accepted and gaining wider acceptance all over the world it is also believed that you are the reincarnation of kunhu lama so can you give us your perspectives on reincarnation do you know who you are and what you will be and can you also tell us who is going to be the next dalai lama well for the last question i have no idea yeah uh, i think uh, the best person to respond to uh, who will be the next dalai lama is his holiness the dalai lama himself um and uh, you know um uh, the i i generally uh, you know try to make sort of a a slight technical difference between rebirth and reincarnation and and both those concepts are are something that we are very well familiar at least in the indian context uh, rebirth simply implies that um you know death is not the end of things uh and that you know uh, based on our karma will be reborn and uh, uh and that's how sort of you know the universe sort of 
continues. Uh, reincarnation implies a certain sense of willfulness, a willfulness meaning that a consciousness or an individual has reached a certain stage where they may be able to uh, direct the time and the place of their birth, uh, meaning that it is, it, is, uh, it is much more willful. And um, uh, the Tibetans, you know, because of a variety of reasons, uh, uh, created an institution around it, which was to, to find uh, 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 such reincarnations. And there are, there are numerous reasons for why somebody would uh, 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 reincarnate, which is uh, either uh, to continue their own spiritual practices or uh, to serve uh, uh, the world uh, uh, because they believe that their work is unfinished uh, and, and they come back and again and again to, uh, uh, to help, uh, 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 help uh, sentient beings uh, uh, in the Buddhist context. Um, you know, it is something that I think is uh, yet to be explored. I don't believe that we have all the uh, uh, sort of... Um, uh, uh, scientific tools or, or designs to sort of uh, uh, prove or disprove uh, 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 rebirth or, or reincarnation. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, we have. You see, when you when you when you speak from a scientific perspective, it's 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 very simple. You know, when you see a phenomena occur uh, in 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 a repeated manner, you say it's interesting. Uh, when the phenomena occurs at uh, slightly large scale uh, across time, you say, well, this is worth studying. And then you design experiments around it to study. And I think the, the, the whole thing of rebirth and reincarnation uh, is at that stage where we see enough of it happening, not just in Hindu society or Buddhist society and so on, um, that I think it's, um, it's worth studying. It's worth looking at it. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it will be a while when we can uh, actually design uh, scientific experiments to try to uh, uh, try to get some make some sense of it. So I must say that here in India, we are waiting for the rebirth in Kali Yuga Vishnu. And uh, I suppose <laughs> that's what lots of people are anticipating. But I'd like to move on to maybe something that's... Uh, political and slightly economic. So please don't be diplomatic here. What are your views on the China-India relationship, especially in the context of Tibet, the Dalai Lama, and how you are thinking about the future? I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm not an expert uh, um, in economy. I'm not an expert in international relations. Uh, I can just uh, present certain observations. And, you know, the observation is simply that, uh, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama is a master diplomat. Uh, and, and what I mean by master diplomat, that, that if we really sort of uh, look into the crux of what should drive diplomacy, which is the well-being of two parties uh, without making each other miserable, uh, 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 without sort of, uh, getting violent and so on, and and that is that is a role that is something that is all in as a Dalai Lama uh, 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 is uh, plays very well among other things. Um, you know, um, we live in a complex world. We live in a complex sort of society where geopolitics and economic developments are all tied together. And so, uh, while you know, I'm a big fan of. Uh, India becoming a self-reliant country. Uh, but our definition of Swaraj has evolved uh, quite a bit in, in the last century, uh, meaning that self-reliance does not mean uh, uh, to become completely independent of uh, people and nation boundaries around us, meaning that we, we realistically just cannot do that uh, uh, in, the, in the complex world that, that we live in. So self-reliant is important, that, that there ought to be a sense of self-empowerment, uh, self uh, but it has to be done uh, in harmony with how we work with neighboring territories, nations, and so on. And the world has shrunk uh, quite a bit in the last 50 years, uh, given the economic interdependencies, uh, shared resources, and so on. But particularly the, the, the aspect of China, I think, you know, uh, one thing is to think about you know, that in the last 70-odd years or so since India achieved independence, 
um, uh, we have been surrounded by unstable states, unstable nation states. Um, every nation state that we uh, that borders India has had gone through uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, civil wars. There are some are still going through civil wars. There have been certain activities that have been detrimental to the prosperity of that country and also threatening India and so on. And so I think it is important that, that a balance is achieved and, 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 and the, the complexity implies that the balance will not be achieved by wiping out another territory. Uh, you know, war is an outdated endeavor. And what I mean by outdated endeavor is that in today's society, there are no clear winners of war. Uh, and so that's why it, it, it sort of, uh, you know, uh, puts a special emphasis on uh, how we should um, uh, uh, utilize diplomacy. And we have seen, um, at least in the last few months, the, the challenges uh, in the border and so on um, uh, with China, uh, uh, with Pakistan, with Nepal, uh, you know, around shared resources, around um, around. Uh, uh, you know, stat, political status quo and so on. So I think those are the things that, that you know, the sooner uh, we are able to resolve, the better we will be. Uh, that, that India would be more stable and prosperous if it had stable neighbors and prosperous neighbors as well. Uh, and, and that's something that we should pay attention to. Uh, the role of Tibet, again, has changed over a period of time. And I think, you know, uh, 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 His Holiness the Dalai Lama had made an important proposal uh, 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 several decades ago, which was to make Tibet uh, um, uh, a buffer zone, a neutral zone, a, a zone of peace, uh, so to speak. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, point to consider, you know, uh, 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 you know, to have a place, you know, w- one thing that that perhaps a lot of people don't recognize is that you know, over 2.4 billion people in South Asia and Southeast Asia uh, depend on water sources that actually arise in Tibet. Uh, uh, Most of our major rivers in India uh, have their origins in Tibet. Uh, And so it is important for the well-being of all these nations that make a majority of South Asia and Southeast Asia that uh, Tibet be really a peaceful zone, a zone that is not contaminated, a zone that, uh, you know, continues to supply, you see, uh, this pure uh, life-giving thing, water, you see, and, and that is going to become a scarce commodity uh, um, um, uh, in, in many parts of the world. So it's not just about security uh, of, of certain kinds. It has to do with water security. It has to do with food security, not just economic um, and, 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 and land territory kind of security. So I think in, in that regard, uh, Tibet plays a very important role uh, in, in, in the geopolitical uh, framework, and especially uh, from India, uh, especially for India. And that's why I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it would be you know, useful to, to seek a peaceful resolution uh, for all of this. Thank you. That actually presented it in a beautiful perspective. Uh, we do need to work towards the combined well-being of everyone, and and I know the Indus, uh, the you know that our source of water definitely comes from Tibet. So it's not just about water security, but it's about creating well-being for everyone. It it's a lesson for all of us to learn. Um, just moving to the next, you know. Um, to the next part of our uh, conversation. The past one year has been a very difficult year in the sense that we've lived with COVID and we've literally and physically had to go beyond ourselves, you know, beyond our own self of, of thinking about our own security. It actually challenged our, our physical as well as mental limitations, but we have learned many lessons help us to think about how we can create a selfless construct and how do we move to this third dimension as we prepare ourselves for the future? I think, um, you know, uh, one thing to recognize is, is, uh, 
you know, in the in the in the in the business and leadership environment, one of the popular questions, and I'm sure when you were at Harvard Business School, this was something that your colleagues and friend would ask you often, which is, where do you see yourself in next five years? Um, and uh, you know, I can assure you that 99.9 percent of the individuals were wrong in their response in 2015. Uh, you know, meaning that. The plans that we had made for 2020, uh, uh, a lot of us had to go through uh, processes of, of giving up those plans and adapting, constantly adapting to sort of uh, a, a new framework of, of what this uh, world order is. Um, you see, in the spiritual journey, I think it's important to recognize that there's this aspect of false self. False self meaning that we as individuals uh, have become accustomed in, in a complex environment to play many roles. Meaning, you know, it's not just the relational roles that we play as mother, daughter, father, son, brother, and so on. Uh, but the professional roles that we play, the civic roles that we play. And uh, with all these roles, we, we uh, get used to a certain kind of identity. And we, we tie ourselves to those kinds of identities. Uh, to the point that uh, we become uh, uh, very attached to those identities, you see, uh, either very attached to our professional identity or personal identity and so on, um, uh, to the point that we do not reflect on what identities are uh, causing us to limit ourselves, meaning that we are never sort of, uh, we, we seldom push the boundaries of our identities, that you know, either we become complacent or uh, uh, we become miserable and complacent to, to this thing. Um, and so rather than, you know, uh, the, jour the journey, the process uh, is not just from moving from a false self or false ego to selflessness. The idea is that you move, you use selflessness as an aspiration, but you get to a healthy self. You see, a healthy self implying a healthy sense of ego, which is that you come face to face with the idea of who you are uh, uh, and becoming more reflective around what kind of choices and decisions you're going to make uh, that would be conducive, not just for your own well-being, but for the well-being of other uh, that, that are around you. Uh, and, and that's one thing that I think 2020 has uh, offered us as, as a valuable lesson. One is that uncertainty is much more closer than you think, which is that, you know, uh, uncertainty is always looming. It's, it, it's pervasive and everything. But rather than thinking of it as an opportunity, we fear it. You see, uh, we fear the uncertain, we fear the unknown and so on. Uh, but uncertainty is an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to understand and explore what the possibilities might be. Uh, and, and, and that's something that I think 2020 has shown us, which is that, that we can make plans, but if we are too stringent about being attached to those plans, it may be that those plans are not going to pan out, meaning there are so many unknown variables in our life, constantly interacting with each other, that we need to, as humans, as human species, I mean, that's one of the reasons we, we survived um, uh, historically, is that we need to learn to be agile. We, we need to learn to adapt. We need to be resilient. And these are some of the qualities that uh, an individual must cultivate in order to move from the sense of false self to a healthy self, and then develop the sense of compassion or altruism to move to uh, the selfless state. So being selfless is not just the idea that, oh, it is it is. Um, it is a noble thing to do, but selflessness actually implies a process uh, in our own evolution um, and, and that we need to sort of shed these layers of uh, identities that trap us, uh, that limits us, and, and look beyond it and say, what else is possible? What else could I be doing? Where else could I be? That's amazing. Yes. What else could I be doing? You know, there is probably so much more, but uh, let me now open up the floor because there's so many questions coming to me. 
this one is from gautam bodiwala in the uk <clears throat> so his question is how do you justify that life is is a mixture of freedom and necessity you know we are social creatures we are biological creatures uh so we are you know driven by uh certain sort of instinct uh for survival uh those kinds of survival instincts drive a sense of necessity for us but you have to understand that that you know uh once we have you know there are only very few necessities really food water companionship or relationship in certain context a shelter you see whatever we have created beyond that is simply layers of complications you see you know uh uh 20000 years ago when we were cave dwellers you see those were our necessities we actually haven't evolved that much you see what we have created is layers of complexity around it which is that oh now from cave we have moved to a nice house and apartment but there is this kind of uh you know dissatisfaction often that oh this is not enough you see that is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing in our our time which is that we don't actually have a good understanding of what is enough you see and when you ha- don't have a good understanding of what is enough you don't understand what is need or what is necessary you see uh, in that regard then what happens is everything that you desire suddenly becomes a necessity you see and if we are not able to fulfill it it drives us crazy it makes us miserable it makes us jealous it makes us envious it makes us restless you see uh so the first thing that we need to recognize is is that our our understanding of necessity in individual context has evolved you see and it's important to to free ourselves you see from the cycle of differentiating uh, 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 free ourselves from from this sort of constant cycle of need and necessity beyond what is really necessary i said having done that it is also important to understand that we as humans you see as a species you see in some ways are distinct from other species in the sense that we have the ability to be intentional about our life we have the ability to be intentional about how we think it's it's beyond just basic survival planning of hunting and gathering and so on you see meaning that we are also species that thinks about purpose that thinks about meaning uh, we are a species that is able to distinguish between pleasure happiness and joy you see we are a species that experiences suffering but also knows what a uh, absence of suffering might look like you see so that's the thing that when we are seeking the sense of freedom it should not be simply juxtaposed with necessity uh, it should be juxtaposed with the idea that do we clearly understand uh what our intent is what our motivations are do we clearly clearly understand uh what a purpose driven life is you see that we have the right variables in our life present to encourage us to seek a sense of freedom that actually is tied to this experience of joy this experience of meaning this experience of purposefulness so you've taken it beyond maslow's hierarchy and and really taken it to another level of purpose which uh, which i truly believe was a wonderful answer so let me move on to our next question which comes from anand sinivasan why cannot ai be considered as an enabler of higher order knowledge for humans because it is not um you know it is not yet um you know there are many things that uh we uh, we are you know uh, th- there's there's reality and then there's fiction and there's hype you see and 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 we do tend to create uh in in tech sectors uh quite a bit of hype um uh, you know it's 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 different from uh being ambitious or or having an aspiration to create better tools and 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 platforms uh in 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 uh, emerging technologies meaning you know 
there, there are things about, you know, uh, what do we mean by higher intelligence orders? You see, um, is it that AI would know more or is it that AI could process more and calculate at a much faster speed and so on? Uh, is it that AI can absorb and process more data than a single human brain? Or is it that AI would give us the meaning of life? <laughs> you see? Uh, meaning that there is a range of queries and questions that, that human species has, has uh, sort of delved into uh, uh, historically and so on. And, and so, you know, I think that in the, in the long run, if done correctly, uh, AI could become an excellent assistive tool, uh, you know, in things like uh, um, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, even simple things like uh, freeing our time, you see. I mean, one of the arguments that is often given uh, in, in sort of a, 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 a utopian model of artificial intelligence is that it would give humans free time. Now, you see, one thing that we have to look into is that historically humans or a group of humans have always gotten in trouble when they had free time, see, you know? So the question is not that AI is going to create more free time for us humans. The question becomes, what would humans do in that free time? Meaning that are we actually going to be more creative? Are we going to become artists? Are we going to become more spiritual? Are we going to um, do something that fosters collective well-being of, of certain sorts? Or are we going to become troublemakers and get in trouble because the mind is going to run idle? You see, because everything busy and occupied is, is, is now taken over by AI. So there are deeper questions around those kinds of issues um, uh, that we need to think about. And, and I think currently, in the current landscape of, of, of development, it's probably best to simply think of AI as an extended form of intelligence, not artificial, so to speak, because that creates this kind of juxtaposition of what is natural intelligence versus artificial intelligence, but extended intelligence, meaning that it is going to extend the capacity and the capability or amplify uh, certain aspects of human intelligence that might aid us to uh, understand things uh, perhaps uh, uh, slightly better um, and, and more efficiently and so on. So, um, you know, in the age of unicorns, what you answered was a per is a perfect segue into the next question, which is, are digital technologies and the ecosystems around us creating more distractions <laughs> in order to monetize attention? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We need to be we need to be cautious, you know, uh, with with all these uh, things that look attractive. And again, you know, I I I I am not a, uh, you know, I'm I'm an optimistic individual uh, uh, for the most part, uh, but I'm also realistic about certain things. And one of the things that we are facing as as a species is to recognize that you know, uh, human behavior historically has been a, a, a gradual. Uh, evolution function, meaning that our behaviors have evolved, changed, adapted to circumstances, but we were given thousands, if not millions of years to adapt to those kinds of things. And you can already see the, 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 the impact of certain kinds of technologies um, that are adverse to our health, that are adverse to uh, uh, our, our sense of well-being, because we are not able to adapt to it in, in, in a manner, meaning we are creating technologies at much faster pace than we are yet programmed uh, to, to adapt to it. So we may create sort of, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, a storyline or a narrative that how, you know, uh, uh, certain kinds of technologies will make our life comfortable, will make things much more accessible. But what we need to also pay attention is to whether it is having uh, you know, uh, a positive or detrimental effect in our patterns, in our behavior. Uh, you know, simple things like, um, you know, uh, remember the time, um, you know, uh, a lot of us uh, have been in that generation where uh, uh, there were landlines, there were no answering machines, and somebody called you and you, uh, you know, 
if somebody picked up the phone, they were able to write down the message or take the message and, you know, you call them back when you had the availability and so on. Uh, today, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, uh, in the age of cellular technologies, when, when, when such communicative devices have become so immediate, one thing you will see often enough, even in yourself, you will notice uh, that we have created these expectations of instant responses, see, uh, uh, which has short-circuited our ability to be patient, which has short-circuited our ability to sort of uh, to, 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 to rest, to wait. Uh, you know, uh, we send an email. If we don't get anything in 10 minutes, uh, we, uh, we think the person has ignore, is, is ignoring us. Um, or have we written something wrong? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, meaning that it has the, just shortened this, this kind of uh, uh, attention span. It has also created other kinds of issues around image uh, and so on. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, like the usage of social media. You know, we as, as humans were driven by approval ratings and validation. You see, it's an algorithm that is built into us. But we did not sort of you know, make it such that we were seeking validation and approval at such frequency, you see. So what happens is, you know, um, it's, it's, you know uh, it, it's like this online blue syndrome. <laughs> uh, you, know, <laughs> you think you experienced something important in your life, like a gathering or you, you, you had experience at a wonderful restaurant or a wonderful meeting with your friends. You take certain snapshots of it you post it on Facebook or Instagram and you're checking every three to five minutes, how many people have liked it. 10 minutes go by, no thumbs are up. You begin to question all of your 3000 friends. You know, 15 minutes go by, nobody has liked it. You begin to cultivate self doubt. You begin to have that, Oh, maybe my content wasn't as interesting. Then you start to compare it with contents that your friends are posting. You begin to have more self-doubt, almost borderline depression, where you start to say, everybody is having such a good life except for me. Why? Because I'm not experiencing anything worth posting. And when I post it, nobody likes it. You see, so it has created incrementally, you see, these micro experiences of inadequacy, of depression, that I believe we are just beginning to see uh, the scale of it um, in um, in our generation, in our lifetime. I don't think Facebook and Insta will like that very much. They have many other fights to pick with me. This is just one of the issues. <laughs> so I have so many questions. And so I thought I'll ask you one last one, which is uh, how to identify an individual who has actually grown beyond himself which many people believe is beyond plausible explanations. I think growing beyond oneself is, is, is not beyond plausible explanations. It's, it's, it's just a matter of what it is that, that you're seeking in terms of, um, you know, in terms of descriptions and explanations of things and so on. There are a couple of things that, that one needs to sort of pay attention to. One is that, you know, uh, is the person driven by a sense of humility, a sense of intellectual humility? And what is meant by that is that as long as there's humility present in one's life, they will always continue to seek. They will always continue to be curious and so on. You see, we as humans, we are only as good as our ability to grow and self-correct. See, uh, meaning that we can we can witness many things in our lives, but we also have the disposition to say, "I'm not content with this, or this is not good for my well-being. Let me move beyond this." You see, and that's what self-growth implies, which is observation and recognitions of conditions that are limiting us, uh, and then saying that, how is it that I break down these kinds of conditions? How is it that I don't take this conditioning um, uh, uh, for granted? So 
you know, the recognition often happens in those kinds of individuals. Uh, you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of noise that is created around growth. There is a lot of noise that is created around, uh, you know, finding the meaning of life and, and, and so on. But there's no cookie cutter template to this. See, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, and that's something that we as individuals should recognize. This is something that Buddha recognized um, uh, in, in, his, in his own lifetime, which is that, you know, uh, spiritual explorations is not one size fits all. You, uh, you cannot create sort of a universal template of growth. Uh, how we relate to meaning, how we relate to purpose as drivers, as evolutionary functions are quite different for each individual. We may share a path, you see, uh, but it should not be a cookie cutter kind of model. So you look for humility, you look for wisdom, you look for a sense of kindness, you look for a sense of encouragement that such individuals are wonderful, encouraging presence, you see, meaning that they don't have to write bestsellers or give pep talks uh, or motivational speeches. Uh, You know, that's all kind of, you know, borderline charlatan kind of behavior, you see. Encouragement is deep presence, deep presence meaning the person can simply encourage you without uttering a single word, that when you are in their presence, you experience the sense of, I can do this. You experience the sense of, I wish to seek what this person has sought. You get the sense of, uh, you know, that there's more to life and there's more to myself that I should be encouraged uh, uh, to pursue, you see. And just by their mere presence, you see, they are able to foster all these sort of positive catalytic thoughts and ideas and inspirations uh, in you. That's an individual uh, who's evolved. Thank you. Uh, It's been a wonderful 60 minutes. So on behalf of the Apollo family and our friends, I would like to thank the venerable Priyadarshiji for this uh, wonderful conversation and for teaching us about how he unraveled the mystery of his life and work. With this knowledge, I believe that we can move beyond the self and do so much more. But I would also like to thank the thousands of dedicated workers who've worked during these 12 months, uh, not from just Apollo hospitals, but from hospitals everywhere, Um, mothers and fathers looking after children. They truly went beyond themselves to serve society. So my gratitude to all of you, to our patients, thank you for putting your trust in us. I hope we continue to live up to that trust. And let me end with, uh, with something that I really loved from uh, uh, Priya, the Venerable Priya Dashni Ji's book, Running Towards Mystery. So it's a, it goes this way. Are you looking for me? I am in the next seat. You won't find me in stupas or in the shrines or in the cathedrals or in the synagogues. When you really look for me, you will see me instantaneously. You will find me in the tiniest house of time. Kabir asks his student, tell me, who is God? He is the breath within the breath. He is in you and he is also within me. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending time with us this evening. Have a wonderful evening. Stay blessed and stay inspired. Thank you.